everyone to the making of the Tangible History of Athens, a book by 11 Athens historians who collaborated to create this definitive book of Athens architecture, or at least the history of it. Three of the authors are here today. Charlotte Thomas Marshall, who calls herself editor by default, <laughs> uh, and uh, she is editing the book. And she's been soaking up Athens history for about 43 years. She is the author of the Historic Houses of Athens and the Oconee Hill Cemetery uh, of Athens, Georgia, Volume 1. The new book includes three essays by Charlotte. Um, we have two, Milton Leather, who's a native Athenian. And his curiosity about Athens and the people who live here is boundless. He's a great storyteller, too. Um, and one thing he's known for around town, are you nervous? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I've heard worse than this. <laughs> are the wonderful narrated tours that he gives, walking tours, through the Athens Clark Heritage Foundation. Well, easy on that one. <laughs> um, he's also a member of our advisory board for this project, and we thank you. I'm a baby so boomer. Um, and then we also have Gary Doster, who is a Georgia memorabilia collector. I first knew about Gary when I went to see his exhibition of historic postcards at the Linden House Art Center shortly after I moved to Athens. He's also the co-author of the postcard series, Athens, with his granddaughter, Emily. And then we have Stephen Brown, who is the University Archivist Emeritus uh, at the Harvard Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Stephen has literally mined thousands of photographs and documents for these researchers as they uh, put together this project. And I know they're all really grateful to you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these things nobody has seen except for just these folks. So we're looking forward to it. Um, and my name is Madeline Darnell, and I'm the coordinator for the program, The Boomers Reflecting, Sharing, Learning. Well, Charlotte, I get the first word. You do. I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, Madeline. And we appreciate getting to tell you about what we've been doing the last three years. We got started <laughs> three years ago, meeting once a month, talking about moved houses. And Eventually, the scope of our discussions moved beyond moved houses to neighborhoods. And you, this is the front cover that we're thinking of for the book. If you have suggestions, tell us about them. And from this point on, you will be seeing images that will be used in the book, and they are in the order of the essays. And this, these are the committee members, some of them, the late Mary Ann Hudson, and Hubert McAlexander, who was the one most interested in moved houses because of our starting. Ken Story, our photographer and book designer. Hands, yeah. Ken is here. And I'd like for all of the committee members to stand. I think most of us are here today. Pat, all of you. And if somebody would go up by and pick Hubert up, he loves to be waited on. <laughs> so if somebody would drive by and fetch him, he'd be glad to come. I think he's monitoring us at home. Yeah. There are 11 essayists writing 18 essays for this. And uh, we are very appreciative of the Georgia Museum of Art allowing us to have this image of Augustine Smith Clayton, which will appear in Mary Claire's essay about how Athens began. And this image of this house is the only one we have simply because they were taking a picture of the double barrel cannon. So there are many stories about these pictures. We aren't going to address the images behind us. If you want to ask a no. question, you can stop us and we'll talk about it. Yes, really. If there's a, if there's a picture here that you particularly know something about, and what we found out, I'm sure everyone agrees, it's amazing what people some people are the only person that knows a certain thing. Mary Ann Hudson got her essays written just in time because she knew things that nobody else knew, and it came out all the time in the committee meetings. And
And if you know, if you see a picture up here and you, your grandparents live there, your neighbors, if you know something about it, please raise your hand up because we can still learn things today that can go in the book. And as we said constantly through our committee meetings, well, we can't get into that for this book. That'll have to be the next one. <laughs> because we're just interested in everything about the history of Athens, so we'll take your notes. And if we don't write about it, we'll save it for somebody who will write about it, because we don't want to lose any of this information. I want to say that if it were not for Stephen Brown and his great knowledge of the collections in the Hargrit Rare Book and Manuscript Library, this book would not be the well-illustrated book that it's going to be, and it is going to be full of images that nobody has seen for decades. We have mined the resources of the Hargrit, and they are rich. So this, and this I can see Steve is mortified to be hearing this <laughs> up here because it's the truth. But I know you don't like to attract attention to yourself. He's just thinking if you gauge his ignorance of the rest of the collections, there are so many more books to come out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one other thing I want to say about the Harvard, and then I'll go and hush and let the others talk, is that they have very generously, Chantel Dunham, has very generously invited us to have the uh, release of the book here in December. We promised to have it ready by December the no. 7th. And so she says, I can invite you all to come. That will be a Saturday Chantel, afternoon. Chantel, hold your hand up. <laughs> Matter of fact, stand up and let them see who you are, Chantel. Really. Chantel. <laughs> <laughs> Chantel is the developer. Officer for the uh, Russell Library. And, and so much more. She loves Georgians whether they've got any money or not. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we're greatly in Chantel's debt for many things. So it's very appropriate that this meeting is taking place in this auditorium today because so much of what we're doing is dependent upon the hard work. Okay? Well, Gary, a lot of it is dependent yeah, upon what you are. It sure is. I've, I've played a very small part in this whole thing. I'm, you and Stephen. I've mostly, <laughs> yeah. I've mostly been just trying to help these real authors. I'm just mm -hmm. kind of sidelined. Yeah, we do it. Tell about your three contributions. Well, I was asked to write an annotated compendium for the book, trying to, trying to list all the historic houses and monuments and buildings and churches and so forth that have been moved. And then I, I am, as they mentioned earlier, I am a collector, and I had some interesting old letters that, that give some good information about Athens from the 1840s and 50s that's never been published. So we developed that into a chapter. Of these, uh, you, you'll, you'll particularly enjoy some of the comments and those. And there's, uh, there, there have been a number of stories written about Athens many, many years ago that are somewhat obscure that, that very few people know about today, and I brought some of those together and, and, and have a chapter here called 19th Century Views of Athens, and it's from these earlier stories that were published, you know, 100 years or more ago. Uh, it's been a labor of love. It, it has been a lot of hard work, uh, but I have enjoyed it very much, as I'm sure the rest of these, these folks have. And besides that, Gary's a very careful editor. The two best editors we had were George Marshall, who died... In September, the 5th. September the 5th, who was uh, much more than an editor to Charlotte, but he was certainly that. And and Gary, so careful. As a matter of fact, Gary caught a typo on the title on the cover of the dust jacket that nobody else has even noticed. And Ken fixed it. And Ken fixed Ken's story fixed it. But no, he's a very careful editor, and uh, so was George Marshall, and uh, and he's uh, Gary's an essayist also. There's some people who can't hear in the back. Oh. How about getting closer? To How about moving closer? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are lots of seats down here. Milton, we can hear you. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, Madeline, I did not move what? that microphone because Charlotte told me before we got here I was not to touch anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, In, including and, Chantel. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the microphone was a little too far away, but I was afraid to touch okay. it. Okay. If, if you don't hear us at any point, wave, and we'll speak. Yeah, up. just hold. If you, can you hear us now? Or? Okay. 
as long as I've got the mic right now, I do want to say that early in our meetings, we talked about the fact that we are all uh, indebted to people now long dead who were our mentors and preceptors who told us what they had heard in their childhood and throughout their lives, what they had researched. And so we are the repository of what they did not publish. Mm -hmm. And we felt a responsibility to put that on paper. And I hope we've done that in this. My husband was fond of saying, the written word remains. And so we're trying to get it in writing. And see, we're fortunate enough to have, we have an insider's view of Athens and an outsider's view and outsiders who became insiders. I've always said that Athens is a place where you can become an Athenian if you're interested in such a thing. I mean, it's not Madison, Georgia, it's not Savannah, where you would never be considered local. But Athens, because of the university, Athens has always welcomed newcomers with talent. I always bring up the Stegemans, you know, Coach Stegemans from Holland, Michigan, and Miss Stegemans from Chicago. And to me, they, they came in 1919 or 18, Jody? What year? One came in December. Joanna, Trayla, and John. Oh, huh? 1918. Well, that's why I had the date confused. And they, to me, are the quintessential Athenians, because <laughs> you can become an Athenian. But you take a person like Marianne Martin from Demarest, Georgia comes to Athens as a student, she sees Athens for what it is as an outsider. She marries a Hodson, poor thing, <laughs> and becomes a Hodson, and becomes the repository for all things Hodson, which is, some of you may not know, but that's a very large job. <laughs> and Marianne saw it as an insider before she died, so she's had the, the advantage of coming as an outsider and becoming an insider and writing from that perspective, which is so rich. And I came from outside and married someone who had first married an old Athens girl, and her family adopted me and was determined that I was going to learn about old Athens, and George used to call me pseudo-old Athens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stephen, grab the I'll, microphone. I'm, I'm from so far outside, they, they keep an eye on me when they put out the Confederate Constitution. <laughs> He's from Columbus, Ohio. But he has absorbed that, like these others. And uh, one of the, you know, as uh, Milton made clear and Gary, one of the really interesting things about Athens are the number of people who can work and connect the dots. Uh, we just flashed up a couple of pictures from the Colonial Danes, and that's a, a great collection of an exhibit we have here that was put up in 1942. And as we've gone along with some mysteries, suddenly somebody's typed caption from 1942, and we don't even know who did it, mm -hmm. has brought forward a lost piece of information that you can match up with maybe something that Gary holds or Gary knows or mm -hmm. Milton or Charlotte, and suddenly the pieces just fall into place. Mm -hmm. Now, the point is well taken. It has to be done now while there are the people mm -hmm. to connect the dots. And that's where it's exciting to have so many folks here who do know the story and do know the information about Athens. There were certain people like Ms. Sufan Barra Tate who had almost a genetic memory. You know, she was a member of the Barra family and married Dean William Tate. And she remembered everything that her Uncle Dave Barra, her the chancellor of the university, told her walking around campus as a child, didn't she, Charlotte? Mm -hmm. And she remembered all of it, and thank goodness a lot of it got down in her Remembering Athens book. Um, and who put out Remembering Athens? Athens Historical. Today. That was Athens Historical. And most of these uh, this, these books have been Athens Historical Society books, but this one won't be, unfortunately. I, I think most of the, most of the, uh, the cash in the drawer at Athens Historical comes from Gary and Charlotte's books, and maybe Miss Sue fans to a degree, but Athens, and this was going to be Athens historical, but for some reason they seemed reluctant to go along with it, but that's another story. Well, we're such a freewheeling group. <laughs> 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 you can't harness us, and so we decided we'd do it ourselves and uh, maintain control. And 
We hope you like what we control. But I mean, the most wonderful recent publication from Athens Historical, of course, is the Oconee Hill Cemetery book. And how many of you got anybody buried at Oconee Hill Cemetery? Well, I hope you own that book. It's only volume one of of three to come. And Charlotte is supposed to be at home working on volume two and three, except she's working on this book. And, and the, one of the reasons that I was so interested in this committee that this book rose from is that I had spent over a year getting up every morning working on that cemetery manuscript and working until after midnight that day and repeating the next day and the next. And I was in isolation, and I'm a people person. And I was so ready for people. And so when we formed this committee that grew, it was just a delight to enjoy the fellowship of people who cared about the same things that I care about. And we went around to restaurants until either the restaurant got too loud for us or we got too loud for the <laughs> restaurant. And so Sam Thomas invited us to start meeting at the TRR Cobb House and providing a uh, something to drink. So uh, <laughs> we took him up on it. Uh, and Mary Ann would always bring us enough sandwiches for those who didn't bring their own sandwiches. We met at lunchtime. But we sat around the table in the Thomas R. Archive House, and we discussed what we were researching and what we needed to do and what we wanted to know more about. And it was just a wonderful environment, Sam. For us to meet in and for this book to stand up, Sam. Show them, show them who you are. <laughs> Sam is a <the> curator. <laughs> Sam is the curator of the TRR Cobb House, and he was in charge of a huge historical complex named what? Uh, historic Bratton Brattonsville, Brattonsville in the Carolinas, and when he. Uh, was uh, interested in this job, and he talked to Tad Brown, and he heard the magic words, no fundraising. <laughs> he said, that job is for me, because he had done a lot of that. And thank goodness Watson Brown Foundation has, has deep pockets, and Sam doesn't have to fundraise, because he wouldn't be any good at it anyway. <laughs> this is John A. Cobb, who started Cobham, and his wife, and here she is, close up. But everybody who's a descendant of the Cobbs raised their hand. There are a lot of you in here. And you've driven from out of town to be The best-looking one is Virginia right there that's just come from Fort Valley. Stand up, Virginia. And this lady, and she is not only a Cobb, she's a Hodson, she's a Talman, she's a... What aren't you? <laughs> anyway, she's a genealogical Clapham Junction. All those meet in Virginia. And you do, you do hey. not know the links we've been to to get some of these images, and I'm still looking for one of John Cobb Rutherford, and I think I'm headed to Emory's library to look for it and a special collection uh, later this week. And his, his descend <laughs> and his descendants are in Los Angeles so um, and other places. And, 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 and Atlanta. And Atlanta. Mr. Seidel. Yeah, that's right. Rutherford side there. That, that little girl looked like, well, she's gone now, but she yeah. looked like she really had something on her mind. <laughs> We're changing the slides rapidly, so you have to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that hasn't been mentioned that, that a lot of these folks would be interested in is that, is that right now that we're looking like it's going to be about 300 pages. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's wonderful text and wonderful images throughout the book. And the editors have not tried to, the, the essays are as they were written basically, just with an editor's glance over them, or maybe more than a glance from you and George. But, uh, the, but, but the personality, Mary Ann Hodson's personality comes right out of that essay. Lee Epting's personality <laughs> comes right out of his essay about the hill, which he calls an orphanage for houses who have lost their parents. <laughs> <laughs> it really is a wonderful chapel, and it's it's quintessential Lee Epting, which, I mean, Jerry left him over it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we love him, but, you know, who could live with him? This is, this is where uh, 
Ken was pictured taking pictures of these logs. This is an 1820s house. It's a Nicholson that was house. The first stagecoach stop out of Athens on the Jefferson Road. How many of you know where this house is on the Jefferson Road? Right. That's okay. one of the ranch and Nicholson. It's built house. Ranch and Nicholson. That's right. Okay, That's yes. right. And it's called Gum Springs back Gum in Springs. the early days. Are you related to them? Yeah, yeah. Is that where that huge tree is? No, Near it's beyond that, Be beyond and that. on the other side of the road. You can't really see it. Yes, down in there. And and the old Federal Road, you can see the road banks of the old Federal Road that comes past Cars Hill, you know, over on Oconee Street. The Federal Road comes there with that wall built out there by Cars Hill, and it continues. That road was called the Federal, High, the federal Road to Gainesville, Dahlonega, and the Gold Country. That tree is about to be cut down. The tree's gone. That is another story, but the tree's gone. Yeah. What's that? The Boggs family planted that tree, like Boggs Road, yeah. off of uh, John Collier. Are you a Boggs? Yeah, because I know those Boggs is that was Boggs Chapel. Boggs Chapel and uh right. Sure, I know it is, yeah. Well that's great. Well you need to come speak to us after the meeting, please. Madeline said <laughs> Madeline is so polite. She she said when we came for a run through, she said, I'm a little worried it might run over. I said A little worried <laughs> <laughs> you are seeing wonderful images of houses built in the 20th century in Marianne Hodgson's essay on builders and architects. And this is a house that was done by her stepfather, and then this is done by Mr. Heary for the Tillman. Louis Fennessy Tillman. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting how often a piece of another house saved for one of these modern homes, or modern in 1940, when they were documented, gives all sorts of clues to the long gone house that stood on Thomas Street, perhaps. This was for the first dean of women, Mary Linden. John Waters' home, this is an Orr house, so was Mary Linden's house done by Orr. Oh, and who gave those plans to the Sams as a wedding present? I Hubert. can't remember all the details. Hubert. No, no, I'm no, not here, but um. And this, this has you'll see this in another essay. It's got a wonderful Palladian window that was saved from the Chase House. That's where Milton grew up. My parents wanted a new house in the suburbs. My mother grew up on Millage. My father on Hill Street. And uh, when they came back from from the Pentagon, uh, where he, Buddy and Agnes Milton lived at the corner of Millage and Oakland, that was a frame house. And Jim White, the owner of the National Bank of Athens, the, like Whitehall, the White family, uh, his sister lived there, Miss Sally Fanny White, Yao, that I'm sure my cousins remember. And it was a frame building, and they stuffed, uh, my father stuffed steel wool in the rat holes. This is 1946. Stuffed steel wool in the rat holes, and my mother put sheets at the fan lights of that front door where the Millers live, and that entrance hall was my nursery. And my mother never went out to Rock Glen Road off McQuirta of Drive to see that white house, that house going up because it was too far out there. <laughs> <laughs> but we have brought it up to, to mid mid 20th and even late 20th century architects. Okay. And this is the man who really built Athens after the Civil War, Mr. McGinney. Manasseh B. McGinty. And it was his house moving that really provoked a lot of the start of the book, wasn't it? Well, it was Mr. McGinney and W.W. Thomas. Uh, that's what started it was uh, Hubert McAlexander said he grew up in Holly Springs, Mississippi, a beautiful town. But he said no house was ever moved in Holly Springs, Mississippi. But he said it seems like his, everything in Athens got moved. <laughs> Miss Sue Fan Tate said it was W.W. W. Thomas when he wasn't uh, building things, he was moving them. And see, Hubert and Pat's house next to the tree that owns itself was on Millage Avenue where the Lipscomb House, where Chancellor Lipscomb's house, the big brick colonial revival house at uh, Millage and Waddell, 
Millijan Waddell, Waddell, as it used to be, Waddell now, but Waddell, like Tony Dorsett. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the um, that 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 house was moved down to Deering, so these rich, well, they're kin to you, Virginia, so the children of the chancellor could build this fancy house for their mother, I guess, right, mm -hmm. Virginia? Right. Virginia wasn't watching. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. But, but Athens really has been moving houses since before the Civil War. If you are familiar with pink chimneys on Deering Street, it once sat up on the ridge north of downtown. And when they wanted to build the Ware House, now the Ware Linden House, that house had to be moved off the lot, and it was taken over to Deering Street. And, and so many houses, because the Joseph Henry Lumpkin House was rolled down to Prince Avenue. It used to be up on the hill. Even with that first the 1835 Howell Cobb House, the Lumpkin House, all the way on that ridge, with the exception of the uh, of the gully at Pulaski Street, all the way over to the Linden House. That was a ridge, and that faced north, facing Athens. Charlotte's articles about the bookends of Athens, all of the big houses, of course the first houses on Oconee Street, coming up from the river, Cars Hill and up the river. Then Char the big houses facing west on Thomas Street, many of the parts of which were salvaged, salvaged by people like Hubert Owens, and they showed up in Lucy and Buddy Allen's house and other houses, the Bob Watterson houses. I don't know the people that own it now, but the uh, Don and Diana Terry owned it, and, the, and Lucy and Buddy Allen, and, and that has a beautiful Palladian window that came off of Thomas Street. No, it came off of Baldwin Street. Baldwin Street, and then the other bookend is Pulaski, with the big houses facing east. So uh, where First Baptist Church was, was a Blanton Hill house, beautiful Greek revival house that was uh, disassembled and, and reassembled on the boulevard. The boulevard is. My mother and my Aunt Mary Cobb, the neighbor's voice, mother used to say, the boulevard. Uh, it was reassembled there, but then it fell down because it wasn't put back together well. But you had the Blanton Hill House. You had uh, the Stephen Thomas House, which was a YWCO that got turned. You had the, the um, Ross Crane House, which is SAE House. And then the houses on the corner, right? Mm -hmm. The Bird House and the Smith House. And um, all these houses have been moving. Of course, you know, now um, Bill Berry has the Smith House out in Oconee County, and the Smith House was on the corner of Pulaski and, and Prince, and somebody took Miss Martha Smith out, Fran, Fran uh, Lane's aunt, and uh, took Miss Martha out to see the home, play, home place that was on the corner of Pulaski, and now it has 45 Temple of the Winds columns around it, and on the way back into Athens, Miss Martha said, it doesn't look like the home place. <laughs> but, I mean, she liked it, but she said it does not look like the home place, really. And, and, and speaking of how many houses have been moved, I checked uh, in my companion this morning, and I have documented at least 35 houses that have been moved in Athens. Some of them moved forward on the lot mm -hmm. to make room on the back of the lot for more buildings. That's right. Some of them turn to face another street, That's right. and some of them moved all the way across town. But at least 35 in the compendium, See the, in addition to yeah. churches and buildings, or the two, office buildings. And the two houses on the corner of Hill and Harris Street, the house that my family lived in, was we call the Little Howell Cobb House, because the big one on top of Pope Street is about twice as big. Uh, and that house was built in the middle of the whole city block. John B. Lamar, Miss Howell Cobb's brother, bought... Uh, four Cobham lots and two pie-shaped university lots. So President Alonzo Church's name is on that deed. So he put those six lots together. Charlotte made me a map of it one time. And, and John B. Lamar built the house we lived in for his sister so she didn't have to go to the governor's mansion in Milledgeville because Mary Ann Lamar Cobb considered politics a fetid pool. <laughs> and she didn't want it. She wanted to stay in Athens with her two boys and so her brother John built that house for her to live in in Athens for $3,200 in 1849. And then the Judge Henry West house that Charlotte married into that family, where Cuppy and Tootie Roberts live now, that was in the middle of that whole city block. So after the war, when everybody was broke or later, they moved these houses to the corner and sold off lots around, like for the Cheney house. Judge Andrew J. Cobb built on the opposite corner at Millage and Meggs. And that's just the way... And what we've talked about in this meeting is this is about Athens. 
But it happened thousands and thousands of times across the whole country, and, and maybe not the whole world, but because we have a different kind of domestic architecture in Athens, but it certainly happened from here to California and from Boston. Big houses were put in later. Lots were cut off in smaller houses. So then you've got, you know, the, the big antebellum houses. You've got Italianate houses, Victorian houses, bungalows, uh, craftsmen, you know, everything mixed into a real rich neighborhood. This is the house that Fran took her Aunt Martha to see that now has wings on it in the uh, country. Uh, it was on Prince Avenue. And Milton brings up a point that we talked about many times in our committee meetings, is that our book can serve as a prototype for other communities. Yeah. Because any community that has any years of history has houses like this and has houses that have been moved and and neighborhoods that have started uh, and neighborhoods that have disappeared. And so mm -hmm. they can look at our book and decide how they want to do a book about their time. And it's the same thing, and you have this rapid social mobility in, in America. And the Cobbs were nice people in Virginia, but they came down here and they just bought as much land as they could. I mean, old... Old John Cobb, the grandfather of Howell and Tom, he bought 14,123 acres of Franklin County land, all this was Franklin then, in 1792, three and five, for, 40, for 71 pounds, one shilling, English money. Then in 1799, he sold uh, 5,000 of those same acres for $10 U.S. So sometimes they were land poor because they moved down here from Virginia. They knew what had happened to the land in the Carolinas of Virginia. They bought everything they could. And not only that, then when they got a little money, and this is, I don't know if this will show up in the book or not, then they started feeling a little full of themselves. So, and Greek Revival came into fashion, and that went from New York, they went from Maine to Georgia, and pr probably beyond, New Orleans too, but, but anyway, Greek Revival came in, and so they started building these little, we've had German tourists stop at our house on Hill Street, and they want to see a house of a Confederate general. I said, well, you have architecture we have wonderful architecture in Germany. I've seen some of that. She said, well, yes, but our people don't build little Greek temples for them to live in. <laughs> you know, like, we just don't think of ourselves that way. And so I have to, and they say they have these uh, Civil War parties, the Gone with the Wind parties. And I, I have to interview them on the front steps first. I said, now, what part of the Old South were you interested in? I mean, uh, were you interested in Hitler's plan, too? I mean... We want to value the good part of the Old South, but let's move on. But I think these people that, um, that's a wonderful doorway. Tell them about the doorway. Okay, excuse me, Walter. This came from Thomas Street. This is an 1830s house that Hubert Owen saved the doorway and other features from. And his house is now owned by Lynn Brunt. And we, uh, Ken made this picture. Uh, Lynn let us in and we photographed modern pictures. He saved that mantelpiece from the house on the wonderful? street. And we will see pictures of uh, the doorway being uh, stripped right back down to the original wood and what fine woodwork that is. You saw this This is Hugh Hodgson's house where Betsy this, and Ricky Chester. This things. doorway was saved from Oconee Street. And uh, Gilbert Milner saved that door from the first clubhouse of the Athens Country Club. Which and was a 20th, 20th century and this doorway, but it was salvaged. And this the house that was on the lot where First Baptist Church is. And some of these decorative motifs came from the Michael House, as did this mantelpiece. The twin Michael Houses on Prince Avenue. Uh, that's more. This is from the Michaels, too, isn't it? Yeah. So this is in Mary Ann Hudson's. Uh, chapter on the reuse of architectural details, and it's one of the ri richest essays in the book. Oh, it's so rich. And really, only Marianne could have written this, and after her death, I don't know who's left in Athens that could have written this essay. I mean, Marianne and, and Peggy Banner Allen came from Fort Worth, Texas when she married Hayward, and they observed Athens very keenly, and... Uh, and I told Mary, I told Peggy Allen, one, Big Peggy, one time, I said, I thought all Texans thought Texas was the, I told Marianne, I thought all Texans thought Texas was the greatest place on earth. And Marianne Hodgson said, well, Peggy believes that too, but she would only live in one place, and that's Athens, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
This is E.R. Hodson House where Georgia Power Building is on Prince. Uh, kind of a bastard Greek Revival house, but very comfortable. I mean, all these modern features, good bathrooms, good plumbing, uh, all those things my mother wanted on Rock Glen Road. I saw that little corbel right up there in Mary Ann's house. And this was saved from Cars Hill when it burned, and uh, Miss Orr gave it to Mr. Rowland, and he incorporated it in his house, and Pat and Cooper is, took that picture. Yeah. Uh, this That's the Thurston. This is... Go ahead. Uh, it was Harry that did the Thurston yeah. house. Uh -huh. Okay, here's Lee's chapter. Um, uh, he, we haven't laid it out yet, but you will see him moving in houses, Orphans. and houses on the Orphans, yeah. Well, yeah. Orphans. Yeah. The, the, the hill is the home for houses who have lost their home. Yeah. And it, it, I just love it when the first story is hovering above the second story. It makes it all look so easy, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. I wouldn't have lowered it in the way. And, of course, Lee bought, the house he lives in brought it from South Carolina. Went over and got his great-great-grandfather's house from South Carolina, and I don't think that had anything to do with his first wife leaving him, but it could have. It could have contributed to it. But she loved the project, too, didn't she? Oh, Bobby Epton just loved the project. This is the house that John Knowlton presently uh, lives in. It's and that's Coleman Bark's son and Woody Chastain and Suzanne Keller's daughter. Don't they look happy? <laughs> and they did all their work. There it is now. I know at that wedding, Woody Chastain had sense enough to say, I want to make my toast before Coleman does. <laughs> but this is, and this is where Nancy Butts Thompson lived. This Coach just, Butts' daughter, Wally Butts' daughter. This is just an interim picture. Don't worry. I, I did that as a place marker while we wait for another one. And this is Lee's first house moving experience. And these pictures were copied from a newspaper. We hope to get the original. Uh, but he moved the cabinet's house to save it. As, as Lee is, writes in his essay, he doesn't believe in moving a house just for the sake of moving it, only to save it. And only so he could get to work with Cuppy Roberts <laughs> <laughs> and Mike Rogers and a few others. You, you, this house is very visible to Who you. Who designed that that uh, porch, Lee? Frank McCall? Yeah. It looks like a Frank McCall porch, really. He was an architect from Moultrie. A lot of you are familiar with Frank McCall. We went down to the Georgia Trust Ramble one time, and I, somebody said, what kind of town is Moultrie, Georgia? I said, it's the kind of town where all the men hunt and fish and have their houses designed by Frank McCall. That's the, the uh, dog trot house. Now, would you have undertaken to move that house <laughs> off of Spring Valley Road, right? And that's it. And I mean, only Lee would do this. And this is the house that Lee lives in now before he moved it from Donald, South Carolina. And there's a great picture of Bobby in here, Bobby acting, facing the re... The this, this is it put back together. Yeah. And he appended a house that he got off of Finley Street here because he needed more space. And this is the Armstrong and Bob's house. We can call it that since Hubert's house. It's through the Lane and Lumpkin Hodson house. But here it is put back together with a new front porch. And Lee was going to put a porch like his, and I took Lee to Monroe and showed him a beautiful house over there, and he decided to put that porch on. Then I told Jerry, I said, well, he almost got it. Jerry said, well, that's Lee. He gets about 70% right, you know, but it's a beautiful porch and usable, isn't it? Lee, you can take this stuff up with Milton later. <laughs> <laughs> I give up with Milton many years this. And here's that Armstrong and Dobbs house arriving and its second story being reunited. And Lee still, there's a sign when guests come out to the hill that the Armstrong and Dobbs house and I stopped complaining about it years ago because, I mean, it really ought to be Lane, Lumpkin, Hodson, or... Okay, now we're getting to the Pink Lady Return. And a lot of you were very surprised when they painted that house pink or salmon when it got back to Athens, but they discovered that that was the original color of the house. Plus, there is a painting that got restored of little Lucy Cobb standing in front of her parole home, 
And it is salmon in that portrait. And everything in the red family was masculine before about 1905 or what year, Clem? Late 20s. Oh, 1920s, it shifted, and pink became a baby girl. But even pink in, in uh, 1852 was a masculine color. Uh, anything in the red family was masculine. Okay, and now, now they're going to cycle over. I do want to say one thing. Every period has a zeitgeist or a sort of a, a feeling of the period. After, I grew up. My father used to say Athens was the best place to live and the worst place to make a living. Until I was grown, I said, well, where did all these big houses come from if it's a bad place to make a living? Well, that was a long time ago. You know, that wasn't – so post-war Athens was not that prosperous. Well, Milton, a lot of those people made their money on their plantations in other parts of Georgia. That's true. And they moved here because of the society that they found in Athens. The society and to educate their sons mm -hmm. because the University of Georgia, although it's the flagship university, it was like a small, all male, church related college. It was like a Presbyterian college. The whole faculty was Presbyterian then. And, uh, but uh, it was like a small, all male, all white, church related college. And, and people moved here from their agricultural lands to educate their sons. But what I was going to say is we're in a period when they started building these Greek revival houses. I thought the other day it's like the learning center in this building. They're so pretentious. I mean, not in all bad way, but, I mean, it's like we're going to really tell people who we are, you know, with this Russell building and the, uh, and the uh, Zell Miller. Imagine putting Zell Miller's name on that building. Uh, but anyway, you know, they have these columns. Well, not just to blame the university, the newspaper building. I mean, these are, you know, this is like out of the ring. Like, that's what Votan did, built this power statement. And it's like, and I can imagine Howell Cobb thinking, well, I'm really somebody. I'm just going to build this Greek revival house. I mean, I guess he had new money, like the people that are building these big university buildings. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, it's, thank you for but, going and getting it. But it's, the tone, <laughs> but it's the tone of the times, you know, especially those uh, flush years before yeah. 2008. Big money, big times. It's built a big, pretentious building. But, I mean, some, sometimes you think that people have just grew up with no sense of proportion. Well, these people have traveled, too. Yeah. They have seen the green That's things. right. They've gone to Europe and well, seen... Well, they were. That's true. And That's true. You are very right to bring that up. And Tom uh, Cobb had traveled a lot, and he knew what he was doing when he put the octagonal wing yeah. on the house that his father-in-law gave him and Marion as a wedding present. And he was the first president of the Board of Trustees of Oconee Hills Cemetery, and he knew what a natural landscape cemetery was supposed to look like. And he put in those fences, those cast iron fences over there and the monument on the well, where did Tom Cobb see those octagons? They you travel. think? Where do you think? I don't know where all he went. But I mean they had seen places and John B. Lamar had been all over Europe. He saw Sam knows that a whole lot better than Sam, I Sam, where would they get the idea for those octagons? Was octagonal? Well, that's true. Those that's, those rooms are octagonal. Of course, when my mother saw it, she said, "It's that lumpkin wife. It's not us. Not our size." <laughs> she didn't like the octagons, but I do. Okay, um, Charlotte, I sense there might be a lot of questions out okay. here, and um, I'm going to ask Dottie to uh, give people a microphone because sure. the people listening in won't be able to hear unless you're talking to them. All right. So, uh, anybody got a question? Don't dry out now. <laughs> John Hill, would you like to, may I leave the room, please? <laughs> Who wants to, oh, come on. Would you, would you like to say something, Ken, about I think Milton, your work? I think Milton has a question. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Ken. Have you enjoyed this project? Stand up. <laughs> this is our photographer, our chief photographer. I'm our designer. And designer. Uh, yes, I have enjoyed this. It's it's uh, a pleasure to work with Charlotte and the rest of the gang. Uh, <laughs> diverse people, and Charlotte, you're doing a great job of keeping that confederation together. Uh, it's been very enjoyable. I've learned a lot. I, I, I 
have lived in Athens since um, 86, from graduate school, and didn't give houses a second look around here until I started working with her. And, you know, now I find myself stopping <laughs> and looking at a certain house and knowing what's in it. Well, that happens to people. Helen, Helen McPherson Costantino is here, and her husband, Mark, got interested in Oconee Hill Cemetery taking pictures. And Helen, where are you? I mean, didn't he? he all of a sudden, he got, you know, he, he grew up in Athens, but like me, he didn't pay much attention to it. These places were just here. You want to say anything about that? <laughs> well, it's true, isn't it? I want to go back to something. Ken said about our go. Ken and I have made a lot of trips around town together, photographing for Marianne's articles in particular, and going in homes and in one case in the Hoyt House where we needed to photograph a mantelpiece, and it just so happened that a family <laughs> was having lunch next to that mantelpiece, and I didn't think anything of what I did that day. I don't Yes, I'm full of myself. And but I overheard Ken telling a member of his wife's family about that expedition and he said, and the family was sitting in the way of where I needed to shoot and said, Charlotte just asked them if they would mind moving. <laughs> and he said, right in the middle of their meal they got up <laughs> and let me shoot the mantelpiece. And I'm sure they were thoroughly charmed by Charlotte. I they just, never occurred to them that... I just told them all about the book. <laughs> <laughs> and they knew it was important. But, uh, and we had been up driveways that we weren't quite sure whether we were supposed to go up that day or not, but we didn't get Ricky shot. Ricky Chastain. <laughs> and, uh, we've had a bit, and Ken is the most patient person I've ever worked with and a perfectionist with what he does, so it's going to be. It's so Good amusing day. to watch Ken watch Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that happened. Oh, yeah. Uh, and one thing I would like to say about Athens that I haven't said thus far, I often take tours of uh, Athens, the historic Athens and of the cemetery, and I make a point that Athens is unlike any other town in Georgia. It was created differently, and it has remained different. Now, there were other towns that were created as the homes of institutions of higher learning, but they did not become big towns and then cities. They, they remained very small, and some went backwards because they lost their college. Midway is one of those, and um, Penfield is another. But because we were not founded as an economic center, as a trade town, but as the home of an institution of higher learning, we drew a different kind of population from our inception. And that put its stamp on this town, and this town has a greater tolerance of differences mm -hmm. than any other town that I know about in Georgia, and I celebrate that, mm -hmm. and that's why I love Athens. We've got three hands up, mm -hmm. okay? Your points about the tolerance of differences uh, made me wonder whether the book is going to have anything about the African-American experience. It started out to have it. There's a chapter that's not going to be there that was going to be about um, the, the Michael houses, a Jewish family that built seven beautiful houses in Athens, uh, patronized architects when some of our folks were just hammering a place together. Um, it was uh, the, the Carlton family. There needs to be a whole book. This is going to turn into another book. Yeah. Uh, the Carlton family, That remarkable people, this Carlton family, uh, a fellow made the, not the mistake, it was his good fortune to get in touch with Charlotte one time from Arizona or something, said, do you know anything about the Carltons? Well, after his wife left, he and his wife left three or four days later just stunned about what Charlotte knew about the Carltons. Uh, the, um, the Hodson family, because Marianne said the Hodsons only rented, they didn't build, but that's not technically true. <laughs> 
uh, and an African American family. There are two possibilities, uh, and uh, and some others. I think that's going to be the next book. But of course, there are going to be African Americans all through this because, just as William Faulkner knew, they're the heart and soul of our culture. Sounds patronizing, but it's true. As I mentioned earlier, we are a freewheeling committee, and everybody chose what they wanted to write about. And so that is not an essay in this book. It is something we are all aware needs to be written about. The information was not as easily accessible to us as what we have written about, but there is the intention. Okay. This lady right here. Uh, Uh, it was just kind of a working title, but we would reconsider it, sure. Well, we admit that. We're white people mostly writing it. Right, Yeah. Well, I don't celebrate it, but I am white. <laughs> you celebrate it? Good for you, Gary. <laughs> We I'm sorry, I didn't hear the end of it. You want us to put, you want us, we want us to be the tangible past of white Athens? We'll bring it up in the committee. We can. Well, it's true. It's certainly worth considering. Of course, you could bring, you know, a lot of things into it like that. I mean, we don't really want to leave anybody out, but you got to stop somewhere. Okay. Okay. Hey. Ah. I'm not going to focus on houses. Have you thought about maybe turning your attention to any kind of commercial buildings? That's another book, too. <laughs> and that book has, of course, has white and African American businesses. We have, we have some commercial buildings that were moved, such as the Southern Mutual Building. They're, they're noted in the compendium, and there's been a few churches moved, and the, the town meeting hall at one time, which became the first courthouse in Clark County. Uh, we, we do have some of those in the, in the compendium. Uh, they're just documented. There's, there's not a chapter written about them other than they're, than they're mentioned. I think one way to look at this book since we are a bunch of independent-minded writers and so forth who chose what each one wanted to write about and it was not set forth as a scholarly uh, no, that's project mm -hmm. where you were to cover all of these different bases. Is that is the reason why the book is this way. It is the result of the people who have formed the book. And often pursuing one particular interest. interest. Mm -hmm. right. I and, hadn't thought of it that way, but that's it correct. It's also the result of our individual limitations, yeah. what, what we are uh, capable of writing about. And so we have given you what we can do and what we have heard from our mentors. And perhaps it is somebody else's mission to do what you are talking about, and I hope they will do it. So and you said, Charlotte, you hope that this would be a model for further right. investigation. We've got, in Athens, tremendous repositories, the Athens Regional Library with its Heritage Room, three different collections here. We have these engaged societies that will be outlets for publication, and we have thousands and thousands of stories. And what we're really looking for is uh, connecting, uh, connect the dots. I, I know at times when we hunt down a doorway or something, you start saying, why are we spending all this time on this minutia? You know, why are we so obsessed by, did this house stand here or there? And part of it is through the accumulation of all this minutia, we're generating a narrative and spreading out through the community, but need to bring other people in the same way. And Janice Thurman, an African-American lawyer, she and I have laughed about this. When I was president of the Athens Clark Heritage Foundation, I asked her to be on the board. And after a few meetings, Janice said, this is just silly, you know. I mean, some, in, in a way it seems like preservation is kind of the white person's delusion. I mean, 
Janet said, you know, I've got more important things to do right now than, than try to fix up the old neighborhood, and I don't blame her. I'm always reminded of friends of ours that moved a, a little two-over-two house from Gray, Georgia, into Macon, and he had about 15 fellows helping him one day from Gray, Georgia, to Macon. They were putting it in their backyard, this 1820 house, and uh, and they stopped to the side of the road to let some cars pass, and he heard this black man say, man, I tell you, white folks get a little money, and they're dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean... You know, uh, sometimes this this is a certain focus of this book because, as Stephen and Charlotte say, it's just the part that we know. It's not all of it. And, and we, the closer we got to closing out on the number of essays that we would have in the book, the more we realized there were things we wanted to write about, and we would just look at each other and say, well, that's the next book. And whether the next book will come from any of the 11 of us is a moot question. Uh, it may come from you. It may come from your children. Yeah. Or it may come from people who are just moving into Athens now. Just don't let it get thrown away. Yes. We, we don't want anything thrown away. And if you have pictures or documents that are similar to what we've talked about or you've seen today, let me urge you to put it in a public repository. The Hargret. The Hargret, Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Many years ago, Mary Bondurant Warren got a letter from a lady in Texas who said that she had letters written by a family member about a church that was organized in Athens, and he was the first minister. Well, Mary Claire knew that I had been researching that family, so she put me in touch with uh, the lady in Texas, and a wonderful correspondence blossomed from that. At first, the lady would send me little typed excerpts from the letters. Then she would send me photocopies of the letters, and eventually she sent me the original letters themselves mm. for me to transcribe because through the years I've gotten pretty good at reading As the, is this fellow. <laughs> yeah, the 19th century handwriting. And also I knew the allusions in the mm -hmm. letters, that I'm walking over to so-and-so's house to help with so-and-so, and I knew where this other person lived and what was going on and who was marrying whom that's mentioned in the letters. So I started making type scripts and I annotated the letters. And then I started looking for the other descendants of this family who were in Georgia. Well, they did not have all of the wonderful items that she had. And she started feeling guilty that she had all of this, and they didn't. And she said, perhaps I ought to divide with them. And that put me in a real dilemma, because I didn't want to tell somebody to be selfish, but... I didn't want to see this wonderful collection dispersed when it had been held together for over a hundred years. And I said, instead of dividing, why don't you put it in a repository where through the generations in the future they can all come back and look at it and get copies of it. And instead of it getting lost as it goes out through the branches and the twigs of the family. And I said, since this family was centered in Georgia and in Athens, why don't you put it in the Hargreaves? And she did. <laughs> and that was the speech that Chantel Dunham was going to give. <laughs> so, so that collection with pictures, and this family includes Benjamin Harvey Hill's wife, and there are their pictures in the collections and just other people like that. Great. Well, yes. I just want to take a moment to thank all the members of the committee for the work that you've done. Uh, in addition to being fascinating to those of us who love Athens and have loved it all our lives, I think people need to recognize what a tremendous contribution to the economic future of Athens this kind of book mm -hmm. is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. And I have to uh, say in closing that this got started at Alec and Janet's house. 
been a workshop that Athens Park Heritage Foundation held on how to research the history of your house. And that's when Hubert Mac Alexander got me by the hand and said, Charlotte, you must write a book on moved houses. <laughs> and I said, Hubert, I might know enough to write an article, but not a book. And he would not let me alone. And that's when I called Milton and I said, I know something Hubert's interested in. Let's form a committee. And that, that was the beginning of this book. And that meeting took place, I think, on May the 1st of 2010. And Hubert had had some health problems, and we just wanted to have something that Hubert might be interested in doing to make him feel better. And it was going to be one chapter in the Athens Historian from Athens Historical Society, and that one chapter on moving houses has turned into 300 pages so far. <laughs> and Hubert does feel better. And Hubert feels a lot better. <laughs> Well, I, I want to thank the four panelists especially for coming and uh, helping us put this together and all of you for coming and sharing this afternoon and your thoughts and ideas of Athens history. Appreciate it. And if you have anything to tell us, come up, please.